Welcome, everyone. This is CS 110. Woo! <laughs> Introduction to computer science. I'm Ruben Lechon. And uh, a while back, I was a student. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. Um, and I was pretty good at biology. And everyone told me I should become a doctor. My parents told me I should become a doctor. My teachers told me I should become a doctor. And so when it was time to go to the university, I decided to major in biology on track to go to medical school and eventually go into surgery. And I loved it. I thought it was very interesting. It wasn't until the second year of college when I realized, while I really love biology and I love the idea of cutting someone open and rewiring their organs, um, I was interested in lots of other things. I actually ended up changing my major and I majored in international relations for, a, for one semester. Studied economics, history, politics, read newspapers, really cool stuff. The problem is I also loved biology. The problem was I loved lots of other things. And so there, I had a problem. What do I major in? That was the time when I was supposed to decide what I was going to do with the rest of my life. What was I to do? Then I realized something. And this was, by the way, around the time when there was the big internet bubble, when all the startups were, com were coming out. And I realized that computers were starting to appear everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Every professor that I would talk to, regardless of what department they were in, had a computer. And so I thought, this is interesting. Maybe I should major in computer science. And this will give me the opportunity to work in various industries. So I chose computer science honestly not because I loved computing or I loved engineering per se, but because it gave me the opportunity to work across boundaries, right? I could work in any industry I wanted. And this was the freedom I was looking for. This is why I chose computer science. And I chose computer science for another reason. I love solving problems. And this is what this class is all about. So when you think about solving a problem, we're talking about hard problems. We're talking about big problems. The key is to break the problem down into parts. You break it down into small pieces, bite-side pieces, pieces that you can work with, simple pieces. You begin from there. You start to solve these pieces and then combine them together and then solve the next layer of your problem. And in this way, by adding layer after layer, you go from really simple components into more and more complicated things. Think about the operating systems that you use, whether you're on Windows or Mac. Think about the video games that you play, right? All of those systems are really complicated. They have thousands, if not millions, of lines of code. And you think to yourself, well, how were the engineers able to do this? How were they able to make sense of such complexity? And the key is exactly this. They don't. What they do instead is they write small individual pieces that are simple and then begin to combine those pieces together, which then produce complexity. Now, like I said, this class is all about solving problems. And if you think about it, a problem has certain components. It has its inputs. Anytime you want to solve a problem, you have to learn about the problem. You need information. This is your input. This is your knowledge about the problem. You then produce a series of steps. Commonly, you can think of this as algorithms, right? A series of steps, a, me a mechanism by which you can go from your input to your output, which is the information you, you produce, and that is the solution. So you go from your inputs, go through your algorithm, and then you have your output. Now. When talking about a computer, what is a computer? Well, a computer is some plastic, some metal, some wires, and various pieces. And, but there's a, there's a nuance. It has electricity going into it. So how does a computer using electricity represent information? In order to solve a problem, we need to first represent the information. The first question is, how does a computer represent information? For those, regardless of whether you have a computer science background or not, or whether you've coded in Java or whatever, I'm sure most of you have probably heard of this notion of binary, that computers somehow store information in like zeros and ones. Um, let's actually cast some light on this and really dig into it to understand in detail how this mechanism actually works. 
John. So your computer has these little pieces called transistors. Transistors are like switches. They can be turned on or off. Okay? So think of it this way. When you're in an off mode or you're in an on mode. A yes mode or a no mode. Eh? 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 Two modes, right? Two. Have a look at this light. This is a regular desk lamp. And with this, imagine this is a transistor. It has a switch. I can turn it on. I can turn it off, right? So there are two states that we can represent with such a system, an on mode or an off mode. Now let's map that to numbers. What number do you think this light represents right now? Zero. zero. It's off, right? So it makes sense that it represents zero. John, exactly. It represents a one. Now, if I want to represent a bigger number, well, remember, all I have is two states here. Mm hmm. Right? So how do I represent a larger number? Well, I have to add more transistors. I have to add more switches. I need more of these things. Right? Ta-da! I have another one. Now, logic tells us that if this is 0 and this is 1, well, I have another one. So this must be 2. Right? Uh, well, OK, let's, let's pretend that it was. Let's pretend that this is, well, this is a 0 or 1. This is a 0 or a 1. So together, if they're both on, it must be 1, 1. Logically, this kind of makes sense, right? The problem with this is if I wanted to represent a larger and larger number, I would have to add one of these for every number I want to add, right? That's not a very good use of resources. That doesn't scale very well. If I wanted to reproduce, I don't know, a million, I would need a million one of these. And that becomes a problem, right? Then you have a scaling issue. OK. So let's do something smarter. Let's do something better. Instead, let's assume the off mode, of course, we understand is nothing, zero. Fine. That's one, right? Well, in addition to this combination, I could also do that, right? OK, well, what this means is that we can, instead of just treating this as a zero or one and this as a zero or one, we could instead treat this as a zero or one, but this as a zero or a two. two. So what that would mean is if this was on, this would have a value of 2. If this is on, it has a value of 1. Ready? 3. Beautiful. Now, so, according to, so given just these two things, we can represent four different states, right? The off state, the 0, the on state, 1, the on state, 2, the on state, 3. Yes? I want to represent a bigger number. Ta-da! OK. Now, following this, if this was a 1 or a 0, if this was a 2 or a 0, 4. That's right. This is a 4 or a 0. So that means if it's on, we got a 4. Mm. Very nice. OK. So let me ask you a question. Given three of these things, how many different combinations of numbers can I produce? Eight. 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 Two times two times two, or two to the power of three. Eight. Wait a minute. How much was this again? You just said eight different combinations. Ah, <laughs> very nice. Let's, you have to account for this one. That's one. That's a combination, right? And in fact, and you'll notice this in computer science, as we go forward with programming and so on, you will very often notice that whenever we're counting, we begin with zero rather than one. The Tumo kids know this because they do push-ups from zero to nine. It's pretty cool. OK, so we got that. Good. Let's get into the theory just a little bit. So you guys learned regular numbers, right? Decimals. Dec means 10, right? Decimal. So uh, regular numbers use base 10. 
So if you think about it, you have the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, the thousands place, and so on, right? And what you do is, when you have a number, such as 123, well, we know that 123, actually, one is in the hundreds place, two is in the tens place, and three is in the ones place. And if we multiply one times 100, plus two times 10, plus three times one, and add them up, we end up with 123. This is clear. In binary, we do the same exact thing. Except, instead of having a base 10, we have a base 2. So the first position is 1, second position is 2, third position is 4. And as we move forward, this means 1, this means 2. John. Very nice. A few, now, you may have heard of this notion of a bit, right? A bit is just a short way of saying a binary digit. So each one of these numbers is a binary digit. Bi means two. Binary digit. It can either be one of two things, zero or one. A binary digit is often referred to as a bit. If you've heard of this notion of a byte, very simply, it's nothing more than eight bits. Eight bits makes a byte. Cool? Very nice. Okay. The next question that you may be asking yourselves is, okay, so we can represent numbers in a computer. And we do this using this weird binary thing that has a base 10 rather than, a, sorry, has a base 2 rather than a base 10, which is what we are familiar with. But how do we represent text? You know, if you, if you create some sort of a document, how does a computer store that or represent that in an operation? Well, it turns out that there's a standard called ASCII. Actually, there are lots of standards, but ASCII is kind of the one that's winning. Uh, it stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Nobody cares if you remember that. Don't worry. Um, ASCII. And what this is is simply, it's saying this number means that letter. It's just a mapping. Whenever you see this number, treat it as that letter. That's it. Now, let's focus specifically on the values A through Z. So this is just part of the ASCII standard. And what this is saying is that 65 means A and 90 means Z. So if you see in binary 90, that's referring to Z as long as you're within this context. Clear so far? Good. So if that's clear, tell me what letter this represents. And I've, just for your convenience, I've put up the, the number, the base values up at the top to make it easier for you. 65, which is? A. What does that represent? And get ready to be super excited. What number does that represent again? A. Woo! A, U, A. All right, good. <laughs> you guys really have school pride. I love it. <laughs> All right. So we discussed uh, how a computer can represent data. However, a computer can represent information. Uh, now the second part, the part where we talk about the steps, right? So when you have a problem, you need a series of steps that you have to go through, a series of operations, if you will, to go from the input to the output, right? To go from the problem to the solution. An algorithm, by the way, is nothing more than these series of steps. It sounds like a fancy word. People use it all the time to sound smart. All it means is a bunch of steps. That's it. Let's talk about a very simple algorithm. Suppose we want to discuss an algorithm for getting to class. How could you get to class? Well, there are a bunch of ways, right? One is you could walk. So you could imagine an algorithm, okay, uh, get out of the door, walk down the stairs, you know, go up Sayat Nova, go up Abovian, walk up those long stairs that you have here, go to school, right, or go into the class. Algorithm one, walking, simple. Algorithm two, you want to take a bike, a bicycle. So an algorithm for that might be, okay, go downstairs, unlock your bicycle, get on it, ride up Sayat Nova, ride up Abovian, uh, whatever that street is, Bagremen. Uh, carry your bike up the stairs or go all the way around, go up the stairs or lock it up, go up the stairs and now you're in class. Fair enough. Another one, take public transport. Okay, go downstairs, cross the street, wait for the bus. 
when the bus arrives, the right bus, get on, pay, blah, 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 get off, go up the stairs, you're in class. And lastly, another algorithm is to take a taxi. Uh, whip up your phone, press the GG button, they call you, you say yes, please come, it's actually marked in the right place, they come, you go downstairs, you get in, they drive you directly to the, to, to the entrance, you go into the entrance and you're in class. Question, which of these algorithms is the best algorithm? Okay, we got one riding a bike, because it's green, maybe, because, or I don't know, well walking is kind of green too. Okay, riding a bike, anything else? Okay, taxi is faster, very good. What else? Taxi is expensive. Very good. What else? Walking is cheap. What else? All these are good. You're right. Keep going. Huh? Huh? Come on, Dukhov, speak loudly. Walking is healthy. Absolutely. Yes, as is riding a bike, perhaps. Yes, very good. Good point. What else? You, you take fewer steps when you walk? I mean, yeah, the algorithm is shorter. The algorithm is short. Interesting. Okay, but, um, okay, but uh, the time it would take to run. In other words, to say the time it would take for you to walk to, to, to class. That, though, would be way longer, right, than perhaps taking a taxi. Would you agree with that? Ah, uh, whatever. Yeah, but the same rules apply to you. Okay, fine. You don't count. <laughs> no, no. Great point. Great points. Uh, what else? Is that, is that it? Okay, so you might have noticed something here. That the idea of best algorithm isn't always clear. Sometimes it is. Sometimes some algorithms are just way better than others. That's sure. Uh, like, I don't know, to get here, you first go to Sevan and come back. Yeah, that's a bad algorithm, way worse than just go, right? Okay, yes. But in this case, you've noticed that all the algorithms are correct. All the algorithms will get you from home to class, right? This is all true. But the problem is there are trade-offs. If you're walking, you save money, right? So financially, it's optimal. But at the same time, it takes you a long time to get there, right? Because you have to walk, and that's the slowest mode of transport among these, right? So you save on money, but what you have to do is give up time, right? Um, with taking a taxi, for example, it's the opposite, right? Now, it really depends on context when the two are better. Well, if you're late to class and you have a presentation due, and it's going to count for some ridiculous part of your grade, taking a taxi, in that case, actually is a good idea. Whereas if, you're, if you woke up really early and class isn't for another many, many hours and it's a beautiful day outside, well, in that case, walking is actually makes more sense. Thank you. In that case, walking actually makes more sense. So the key to take away from this is this. Whenever you're talking about algorithms or you're thinking about algorithms or solving some kind of a problem, don't just think of one as being better than another. Computer science, especially software engineering, is all about trade-offs. One of the biggest trade-offs that you will typically make is a trade-off between computation and memory. Very often you will find, not always, but very often, that you can run an algorithm faster if you use more memory. Or the opposite. You lose, use less memory, but you need to do more computing. Right? So the two are very often sort of at odds with each other. And deciding which to use, which trade-offs to accept, really requires you to understand context. It requires you to understand the problem. By the way, while we're on the topic, one of the really cool things about working in different industries is that you, know, you have to try to solve their problem, right? So you go and you work with biologists, or you go work with, I don't know, lawyers. They speak a completely different language from you, right? They've been trained many years, and they've learned all kinds of li linguistic trickery, right, that they know, that, that they use in their domain that you're, you don't know, you're not well versed in. So the first thing you have to do is first learn to communicate with your client, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is you have to learn to try to understand their problem. Understanding the problem is much harder than you think. 
And in my opinion, this is one of the most exciting parts about doing the job that I do. I'm a software engineer, by the way. This is the most exciting part because this allows you the opportunity to go into different industries and learn about that industry. You learn every detail about the problem. You dig deep and you understand all the various factors that affect the problem. These factors can be humans. These factors can be machines. These factors can be weather. It can be all kinds of factors. You try to figure out what in this problem can change the variables. You understand the variables. And based on all of these details, once you have a full and detailed understanding of the problem, you then use your knowledge of engineering and computation to then produce value, produce a solution. Bless you. And the really cool part is that once you've produced your solution, once you've handed them the solution, you leave and the solution continues providing value, even after you've left, even after you've gone home. This is crazy. In fact, you don't actually have to go there anywhere to provide such a solution. You can be sitting anywhere in the world as long as you have access to the internet. You can produce a product and send it globally and have people all around the world use your product, enjoy your product, and gain value out of it. This is amazing, especially for those of you living in Yerevan like me. This is absolutely amazing. Now, the other thing, when I was a student, there was a startup culture starting to form. People were starting to create businesses. And do you know what the, what the biggest sort of financial cost was at the time? Like why a lot of people weren't able to do startups when I was in college? By the way, that was like seven, way too many years ago. Guess. Hmm? Yes, exactly. Buying hardware. Buying hardware, mainly servers, right? So you want, you want to send your stuff and you want to have a server. So server, by the way, is basically a computer that sends your stuff, the stuff you've made, your products, your data, out through the web to whoever you want to receive it, right? So you get requests and you send a result. That's it. That's all a server is. Buying these things, setting them up, being able to scale the server, being able to administer the server, making sure that it doesn't overheat on a summer day. This is really complicated stuff and it's expensive. It's incredibly expensive. Today, we live in an era where we have Google Cloud. We, bless you. We have Amazon, we have IBM now has a clouding system, right? You can go on these sites, rent a server, a really good server, use it for as much as you want, and then stop using it and only pay for what you use. So that means this barrier to entry, this financial barrier that used to exist for startups no longer applies. What this, think about what this means. That means every single one of you, regardless of your background, regardless of where you live, once you have the right engineering background, you can be sitting at a cafe and produce a product and send it all over the world and make lots of people happy and yourself rich. <laughs> there you go. Okay, another example of an algorithm. Let's find a word in the dictionary. So this is where having a microphone that was here would have been easier, but I'll see what I can do. Okay, so here we have a dictionary. Pretend this is an English dictionary. <laughs> All right, so suppose we want to find a word inside. We want, want to find the word operation, okay? One way to do it, and this is perfectly reasonable, by the way, is to go page by page, right? Not here, not there, and so on, right? That's correct. That algorithm is absolutely correct. If I kept doing this, sure, you, you would be here for a few hours, but eventually we would find the word operation, right? Okay, but that's not a very great algorithm. We could do better. Well, one thing we could do is maybe go two pages at a time, right? So two, no, not there. Two, not there. That's a little faster. It's a little bit better. In fact, it's twice as fast. It's still kind of slow though, right? Exactly, and you have the problem of overshooting, which is why you can't just do every third or every fourth, because then you're gonna have to just go back that much, 
Exactly, yes. So that, uh, that problem is not only going to take a while, but it may not be correct, unless we add a special case, as you noted, that we should go back if we overshoot. Very good. What's a better algorithm? Yeah, okay, so both are good. Okay, so one typical thing that I think we can, we can do is simply find roughly the half, halfway mark, roughly. And sort of open it up and go, okay, these are, you know, Ms. And go, okay, O is, you know, comes after M, right? So then I can take the next half, right? So I can forget, think about it. Once I've opened it, I can forget about this half. This, think of this book as a problem. Once I've opened half of it, I forget about half. I've cut my problem down by half, right? The size of the problem is now halved, okay? So then I look in here and I find some sort of a letter and go, okay, it's whatever, arbitrarily. Let's say it's some letter that comes after, oh, oh it's, I should probably go on this side. And I keep sort of chopping it up in half. Let's pretend I am. Until I go, ah, here's the page that has the O. And then I find it and yay. Right? Okay. You're right. A hash lookup would have been better. That's a very good point. So, but then the problem is, yeah, but then I would have to page through the numbers. I would, how would I know which page the numbers, because it's, it's this thick, right? Now the numbers go in order, right? So what I could do is roughly, maybe, open half of it and figure out whether that number, that page number, is to the left or right, and then eventually do binary search that way, right? Or I could just go, brrr, but then if you think of that, brrr, what you would do, right, is turn the pages quickly. You're turning pages. So if we're, we're counting each page turn as an operation, even though you're doing it faster, you're still doing the op many operations. So think of it this way. You might have a faster processor that can do lots of operations quickly, but you're still doing lots of operations, right? That was a very good point, though. Very good point. Okay. So let's look at some charts. So in our first algorithm, if think of n, in this case, as the size of the problem. The size of the problem, when you're talking about a dictionary, is the number of pages, okay? So if you think about it, the size of the, 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 the amount of time it would take me to do that first algorithm where I turn one page at a, t at a time, that algorithm grows linearly in complexity. And by complexity, I mean the amount of time that it takes to do it. Think of it that way, okay? So the amount of time that it takes to go one page at a time through a book that has n pages is roughly n. This is, of course, the worst case scenario. If you go all the way to the end, you've gone n pages, n operations. Like I said, we could have done slightly better. We could have done n over 2 if we did two pages at a time. That would have been better, although there would have been a constant there, as noted, where if we overshot, we would have to come back. But that's a minor constant. Let's forget about it. The main thing is we would improve by n over 2. The last algorithm, though, anyone guess what the complexity is of the last algorithm? Yeah, yeah. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. Let's say this book has 1,000 pages in it, right? If I made it 2,000 pages, how many more steps would I have to take in order to find what I'm looking for? One more page. Oh, sorry, one more operation. That's right. Because if you remember, we're dividing the problem in half. So the fact that we've doubled it, if we go backward, we half it, we've right back to where we are, and that's one operation. The other way you can think about it is, imagine you have a book that just has two pages in it, and it keeps doubling in size. You keep multiplying it times two. You're going to have exponential growth, right? The book is going to get bigger, and then bigger, and then way bigger, right? What we're doing here is the opposite. We're dividing by two. We're making everything smaller in half every time. So we get the opposite, logarithmic growth. Make sense? In general. Okay. So, <laughs> welcome everyone to CS110. I'm very excited to have you here, and I wanted to talk a little. So that first part where we talked about binary and we talked about algorithms was just there to give you a taste of things to come. We're going to be talking about all kinds of things. We're going to talk about, so first of all, the programming languages. There are going to be two. 
We're going to start off with JavaScript. We're going to learn all the fundamentals. We're going to learn functions and variables and scoping and all these fancy words that some of you may know and some of you may not. And then towards the end, we'll move to Java. And uh, it's always good to know at least two languages. The more languages you know, the more sort of well-versed you will be in this field. So I think it's, it's a good idea for you guys to learn a bit of Java later. Also, some of the classes that you'll be taking moving forward, like object-oriented programming and data structures, um, I think are going to require a bit of Java or C++. But if you know Java, you'll be able to figure it out. Um, we're we're going to talk about cryptography. We're going to talk about security. We're going to talk about algorithms and all kinds of sorting algorithms and figure out how to compute complexity of algorithms. We're going to talk about game development. We're going to do some graphics using Canvas. And, well, once you know JavaScript, Canvas is awesome. Uh, we're going to talk about server development using Node. We're going to do client-side development in the browser using HTML and CSS. We're going to talk about databases. We're going to talk about a lot. Um, I told you it would be scary to have an excited, excited teacher. The more excited I am, the more work you do. You guys see how this works? Um, but again, the, the net result, the, the goal of all of this, honestly, and I'll be completely honest with you, is not for me to teach you JavaScript. That's not the goal. I think that's part of it. I think it's necessary to learn programming. But again, that's not the goal. The goal is to help you guys move forward with your ability to solve problems. I want you guys to have the power, the ability to leverage computing to be able to solve really hard problems. And by the way, the, in this class, some of you are computer science majors. Awesome. I'm, I love that you're here. I'm happy to see you. Some of you, I'm guessing, are not. And just so, John, there's one. Who is not a computer science major? John, that's how it's done. Awesome. So, so first of all, let me begin by saying that this is introduction to computer science. I am going to assume that you know nothing about computer science. For those of you who have a background in, in programming or whatever, trust me, there's plenty for you to do. The, the assignments are not going to be easy and there will be plenty. To, so what I will do is I will start with nothing, but we will move very quickly. And your goal is to simply keep up. Now, there is no book for this class. There's no uh, sort of official thing that I want you guys to go and buy. One of the great advantages of being in this field is that most of what you will ever need to learn and what you will ever need to learn in the future um, is going to be available for you on the web. The answers to many of the problems I will give you are there on the web for you to copy and paste. There is, I won't, I'm not going to give you anything so new and so revolutionary that you guys, that there's nowhere to be found on the web. There's always one other student somewhere on the web who did the same homework assignment as you. Let me begin by this. No one cares about your grade except you. And that's if you care. No one. Maybe your parents, and that's just because, you know, they love you and uh, no one's going to care. When you guys are done, when, once you graduate and you move forward, no employer is going to be like, what did you get in Ruben's class, CS1? Can, show me. No one's going to care. Nobody. What they are going to care about is whether you can provide value to their companies. Furthermore, let's forget for a moment that you're going to work for someone else. You yourselves may start companies. And by the way, you may start companies while you're at AUA. There's no point in waiting. You don't need money. We've established that already. You just need time. And you need the, the will, the desire to succeed. That means you can begin a company now. Ask yourself this very simple, fundamental question. Would you hire yourself? Would you care what grade you got, bless you, in CS 110? Or math, or whatever it is that you're taking? Probably not, right? Because ultimately, the software that you produce, if it fails or it doesn't work well, you can't go to the client and go, but I got an A. <laughs> Nobody cares. The goal is not the grade. The goal is not the certificate at the end of your four-year tunnel. That is not the goal. The goal is for you to feel like, to have the confidence and the knowledge 
so that you can move forward and achieve awesomeness. That's it. Now, a few more details. As you can see, uh, I'm being recorded. This class is being recorded, and at the end of each week, uh, a, a version of this will be put on YouTube. This is for a number of reasons. One, so that if you don't come to class that day, because of whatever reason, uh, you can catch up by going on YouTube and watching what happened. So that's one thing. It's, it will be very useful to you. And by the way, uh, as far as quizzes and things like that, I'm mainly going to ask you things that we've discussed in class, mainly. There might be a few exceptions, but for the most part, it's going to be material covered in class. And so if you miss class, uh, you can either get notes from someone else, but you can also just watch the video. So don't worry about taking notes. and Don't worry. All of this will be available for you moving forward. I'll also make the slides available, including this cute monkey, uh, so that you can go back and, and, and go through it if you like. As I mentioned, the web has a vast amount of information for you to use, for you to leverage. Don't only look at the links that I give you. Don't only watch the videos or the tutorials that I give you. Explore. There is a lot of really great content out there. Use it, take advantage of it, and grow. But here's the thing. One of the things that I want to be part of our culture, I don't want us to be users only. Yes, we will be users. We will leverage other people's work. But I want us to be creators as well. I want us to be contributors. And as contributors, in the same way that this lecture here is going to be on YouTube for you to see and for really anyone to see, in the same exact way, your homework assignments, your problem sets, are eventually going to appear on YouTube. And here's the rule. They have to be, when you submit your assignments, they have to be made public, and they have to stay public at least until the end of the semester. This will give you ample time to be embarrassed in front of the entire world. I was asked earlier today, why? Why are we doing YouTube videos? What's the advantage of that? I'll tell you exactly why. I found that there are two ways to really understand whether someone knows something. One is if they know how to use it in practice, if they can build it, right? If you can build a computer, you probably know computers. Fair? Okay. The second way is if you can explain it to someone else, if you can teach it. If you can teach it and the other person can actually understand it, you know what you're talking about. So with YouTube, what we can do, or with videos, and this is, by the way, why I asked if everyone has access to digital cameras, and I'm happy that you do, um, we will be doing tutorials. So when we learn something new, you're going to teach it to the entire world by producing a video. When we have coding assignments, you're going to do a screencast where you explain your code. The ideal situation is that I would sit next to each and every one of you, look at your code, and you explain it to me, and we talk about it, but the class is just too big and I don't have the time. So the second best thing is for you to do that sort of thing with the entire world, with the comments turned on. Ah. The second thing, communication skills are key. Regardless of what you're studying, regardless of what you're planning on doing at the end of this class or any other, after AUA or during, being able to communicate your ideas clearly and simply is absolutely key. This, I hope, will be one of the things that you will learn while making these videos. Because it's not enough for you to make a video, it has to be a good one. And I say this not only for your grade, which I don't care about and I hope you don't either, but for yourselves. What, you can think of it this way, you're building yourselves a resume. The videos are going to be available online for all to see. Your future employers, your current employers, your kids potentially if they stay online, right? In the future. So it's a good idea to do a good job. Not again, not for the grade. Don't worry about the grade, but to produce great content. Now, I want to introduce to you guys the team. Hey, we have a team here. It's not just me. 
you can find the team in their awesome blue shirts. Their names are on their backs, but I will introduce them. Please, please, please. Okay, okay, okay. So we have Zaruhi, the goddess. Woo! We have Vazgen and Armen. There are codes in the back that you can take pictures of or whatever, and you can find, and those take you to their Facebook profile pages. Um, but here they are, they're awesome, they're smart, and they're here to help you, to guide you through your problem sets, getting ready for quizzes, and they are your guides, okay? They will help you navigate through this whole course from beginning to end. They will also have office hours. We're all actually going to have office hours, two hours each. I'll give you guys the details of where and when later on. Thank you guys so much. All right. Now what do we talk about? Does anyone have any questions? No questions. Okay. So here's the first thing you do. First thing you need to do is find our Facebook group. It's a closed group. You go, you request whatever, and we let you in. Uh, to search for it, just type CS110, uh, Introduction to Computer Science. Okay, you'll find it, I'm sure. If you can't, tell me and we'll, or tell the guys and, and the gal and they'll help you. Um, this will be the main uh, mechanism by which we will communicate with you. We will post, there's actually already a link to the syllabus from that group. Um, we will post homework assignments on there, any kind of announcements that you guys might need. Um, and that sort of thing will all be available on the Facebook group. So it's a good idea that you join. Um, you can also add comments. So for example, if we get great YouTube videos, maybe we take like the top few and we, you know, we put them on there and you guys can like them and comment them and share them with your friends. You get the idea. Lots of good stuff there. Um, the syllabus. Let's have a quick look there. Okay, by the way, that's the Facebook group. Don't be scared. Or, or be scared, that's okay too. Um, where's the syllabus? Hang on. We'll be there in one second. What happened to my syllabus? Syllabus, here we go. Open syllabus, okay. So, some details about the class. Uh, you all know when and where and who's teaching. Okay, we can skip that. Um, evaluation. Again, for those of you who actually care about this, fine, I'll tell you. Uh, problem sets are going to count for a lot, 45% of your grade. Uh, there's going to be a, a final project at the end of the course. Um, that's going to be a big chunk. That's about 25%. Um, and then there are going to be quizzes. There, are no, there is no midterm or final. They're just quizzes. There are going to be a bunch of them. Um, I won't tell, but here's the trick. I'm not going to tell you when. And I'm not going to tell you what. What do, we, what do we study for, is what you're probably asking. Study the material that I talk about. That's the answer. If you want to do well in this class, as far as grades go, actually, regardless of grades, if you want to do well in this class, learn what's being discussed. Don't just learn what's going to be on the exam. Again, nobody cares what you get on the exam. Learn the material for yourselves not for the exam, and not for the grades. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited to be here, and um, I'll see you day after tomorrow. Cheers. Okay, bye. <laughs>